And with no further ado, I am going to pass back over to Jared and Lena. Thanks, Kara. The other thing just to mention that is something to look forward to that will happen at the very end of our closing and before we go to the reception is the world premiere of a video about EAN that we're really excited to share with you. So uh, stay tuned for that. But for right now, Lena and I are going to talk about Vermont's greenhouse gas emissions and energy targets. I'm going to start us off with a few slides and then pass over to Lena. <clears throat> so this is a new graph that we've created with the official data from the uh, greenhouse gas inventory recently published by the Agency of Natural Resources. It shows our historical uh, greenhouse gas emissions by sector in the darker colors there on the left from 1990 to 2021, which is the latest year of full inventory data that's been published for Vermont. And to the right, you see the three blue dots that show the requirements, the legal obligations of the Global Warming Solutions Act by January 1st of 2025, 2030, and 2050. I wanna share this table. This comes from a recent four-pager that we put together uh, providing a summary and overview of the latest inventory and forecast. And I know that there's a lot of conversation happening in the state about where do we stand relative to the first obligation of the Solutions Act by January 1st, 2025. Many folks have probably heard uh, claims that Vermont is on track to meet the first legal obligation of the Solutions Act. I just wanna pause here so that we can see a comparison between the inventory, the relevant official data that is how our progress is, tra is tracked by law, which you see in this column here, uh, versus the data that's being used to support the claim that we're on track, which is the middle column um, there. And uh, there is a consistent and significant difference between these two sources of data for greenhouse gas emissions. For the seven years that we have data from the official Vermont greenhouse gas uh, inventory, 2015 to 2021, in comparison to uh, the model that's being pointed to to make the on-track claim, there is an average undercounting of emissions in that other model of 550,000 tons per year relative to the official numbers in the inventory. Um, so that's important knowledge in terms of where are these different claims coming from about on track, not on track. Our analysis at EAN is very clear that we believe we are not on track. It's exceedingly unlikely given the objective data that has been published in previous inventories and that we have available from the tax department that unfortunately, we wish we were, um, but unfortunately the data does not support that at this point. We wanted to share this graph because often, and we see this right now happening in Vermont, the conversations about costs are often exclusively and narrowly constrained to the costs of acting to reduce climate pollution rather than the fuller picture in the more complete equation, which would include the benefits, including energy cost savings for moving away from fossil fuels. And also too often ignored are the costs of inaction or the costs of allowing a high cost, heavily damaging fossil fueled status quo to continue. So one way that we can start to put a number on the cost of inaction or the cost of the status quo, the climate pollution that uh, has been created and is continuing to be created is via something called the social cost of carbon or more broadly, the social cost of greenhouse gases. So recently following recommendations from the National Academy of Sciences, the Environmental Protection Agency, the US EPA, recently estimated the social cost of greenhouse gases. And taking those estimates and applying them to the emissions reductions that Vermont would achieve below our 2023 levels, 
between now and 2050, we see that the Global Warming Solutions Act would ensure that Vermont's climate pollution in aggregate would be reduced by over 100 million metric tons and avoiding uh, $25 billion in social and environmental costs and damages. And so oftentimes, we've historically, we've looked at emissions. We've looked at this lower left-hand portion of the graph showing the emissions. Here, we're really trying to highlight what's in that upper right-hand corner. What are the avoided costs and the, the benefits of not polluting at that level, both in terms of reduced pollu pollution and in energy cost savings and societal benefits? And I want to be really clear. This is, by EPA's own admission, a, a very conservative estimate because many of the values of pollution reduction have not yet been estimated from a monetary perspective, including some of these benefits that you see in this new um, graphic that we've put together on the right of many of the co-benefits of reducing climate pollution. Uh, so to make understanding Vermont's greenhouse gas emissions as accessible as possible, EAN, led by Lena, uh, our data manager and research analyst extraordinaire, uh, cre Lena created an interactive emissions dashboard, which you can find at eanvt.org. It was recently updated by Lena to include the latest inventory data, which you can see a screenshot of here. But the amazing thing is, like, unlike in our annual progress report or in that chart over there, it is not static. So if you want to zoom in on a sector, on a specific year, uh, move around,